there we are. This very messy um, diagram up here, web map, was actually done uh, by looking at all the, the literature. Uh, so this is a variation of what Michelle shared with us yesterday uh, about the Google search, a little more refined. This is basically all of the refereed literature from 2004 to 2014 that had, uh, with a reference, resilience as, a, a, as an issue and where they connected it to other areas. And I think just the value of this, you know, is about what we've been trying to do over the last couple of days, which is this is something, resilience is something that virtually every discipline has been wrestling with. And that could, in many cases, create real tension in academia, right? Where it turns out the psychologists were really the biggest players in resilience, where they would go, you can't use our term, or we only use the term this way. And, you know, oh, these environmental sciences and ecology folks are using resilience here, and we could have tension. For me, of course, what it, is this what really excites me, and it's what really has played out here, and I think the last day and a half, is, ah, there's common ground amongst these disciplines around something. We're all wrestling with, we're not quite sure, we're looking at it a little bit different ways. And what I think is one thing I just really was cheered about <laughs> with the last two days is we didn't go and battle over the definition of resilience. Uh, we really took it as a, just a welcome mat for us to all come together with our various perspectives, with our approaches, but hopefully have seen real value from having had this chance of, of uh, hearing from researchers who have approached this or thought about this in like our keynotes in a very deep way, but from different disciplinary perspectives. This is very powerful. And so I think, uh, I, again, what I, I think my value here is virtually everybody has been involved, but note the connections are really pretty small, right? The actual linkage from one to the other, there are a few, and there are a few multiple ones. But I think the power of the Global Resilience Research Network, ideally, is we really strengthen those connections. That if we have maybe uh, five years, 10 years from now, another such mapping, we would see just far more integration that may be happening across the board as we kind of try to learn from each other. So with that, what I've asked our panelists is actually to do something I hope you might do yourself, um, but but uh, somewhat maybe challenging for such a distinguished group of players who have been uh, you know, in contributing so much to this issue, which is I ask you, I've asked them to think about what actually new thing they learned over the course of the last day and a half, and then also what big question that remains for our community to really wrestle. So that, that's what I've, and Michelle is somebody who got us started uh, yesterday here. I'm gonna put you on the star, star, uh, spot here to get us started in response to that. Okay, so, so we learned about these two questions a total of three minutes ago. Absolutely. And so I've thought long well, and hard about this. Understand it never stops, okay, you get put on the spot. <laughs> so after thinking long and hard about this, I've learned that it rains a lot in Freeburg. <laughs> and, and, but more seriously, uh, I think uh, we, we've talked about resilience as returning to the previous conditions and, and maybe returning to functionality. And I think we have to be careful about that. If you can return eventually to, to functionality, if it takes 100 years, that doesn't make you very resilient. And if you rebuild with the exact same construction methods that you had that created the problem in the first place, that is returning to functionality, but it does, still doesn't make you very resilient. So I think we want to be clear, and, and maybe if it was not clear, that it's always returning to better condition is the intent, so that history doesn't repeat itself, 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 itself. Uh, so, uh, and so maybe the takeaway message is that resilience is really an empowering tool uh, because it allows us to cross disciplines and integrate across disciplines. And so if you say resilient, it's well, resilient compared to what? Um, so, well, to be able to say compared to what, we need to sort of what, quantify it somehow. And once we start to quantify it somehow, it allows us to talk and, and, and compare things across disciplines and integrate things. Um, and for example, the New Zealand uh, study is, in, is bringing all of the dimensions into it. And of course, then it's important to be able to de-aggregate the data, to be able to case study, look into and what contributes to these aspects. So that would be my takeaway message. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna ask you what big question remains to be uh uh, be answered by this community from your perspective? So the big question still remains, how do we do that best? Mm -hmm. 
And uh, it's uh, the, the, the fact that it scales it across disciplines make the pro means the problem gets bigger and bigger. And how do we find the resource uh, in terms of research funding to do tackle that? And without that sort of large scale research funding, we can only you know take little bites at the problem left and right. Great. Sorry. Right. Can I have you? Right. Yes. Well, likewise. I'm still trying to think <laughs> what it is, but. Um, for what it's worth, I think the two things that struck me um, that I learned, and this is really following on from what Michelle has just said, in, in the work that I've been involved in, whether or not you can get back to the state you are, whether, you've, whether the threshold is crossable and returnable, we look at the, the direction and whether or not you're in the same basin of attraction, and the time come to come back is, has been much less of a consideration than whether or not the direction is towards what it was before or somewhere else. And the emphasis on time of, of getting back has been something that, that has struck me as, as being important. And, and part of that then relates to the other thing that, that, that I learned really, which has to do with the risk assessment. Now, what kind of shocked me in a way was the fact that in a number of talks, the cost of the risk is what sort of determines how much it's worth investing in resilience. That was the message that I got. And I found that really difficult because how do you measure the, the economic cost of a risk which is completely uncertain and there's all sorts of difficulties in trying to put a number on it, let alone the cost of it. And when you start putting a cost on it, the immediate thing that came into my mind was what about the secondary effects? and the knock-on effects of that. Are you limiting it to the immediate cost? What about the longer term, by the time you finish, that cost could be huge. And if that determines how much you should put into resilience, I think we're gonna get a, a wrong answer. So what I've learned really is from the engineering technical side is, is I wanna think a lot more about costs and times of return and whether or not that should dictate where your your uh, emphasis and, and energy goes in developing a resilience framework, because we haven't done that before. So um, I, think, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. And, and, and the big question unanswered? Uh, well, the big question, you, you'll notice I kind of stuck up a bit on my own talk there about power and politics, and, and really that, that's the big question for me, because it cropped up a number of times, and we simply don't know how to deal with those. So the big question for me is how do you incorporate um, power and politics into resilience frameworks and, and assessments and um, what you know, we just need to think about power and what does that mean and how and the same with politics it's it's a fuzzy messy area that you that I think requires a lot of attention great thank you great there we go. well I don't know maybe I didn't learn anything but that's not true um, the big thing that I took out from this I, I, I knew well, I've a lot of what we heard was familiar to me, as um, happens probably to all of us at these conferences. But I heard a new term, Hans, yesterday called sense making. And we talk a lot about decision making. And I, that sense making really stuck with me. One, it was a new term, probably because it was made up. But um, if this is a key question. We talked a lot in these keynotes and the panel discussions about the how and the what, and the when, and, and, and even the how much. But the question about why, and does it make sense? And once you put a lot of effort into something, can you stand back and say, does, does that seem right? Um, I think is a really key question. For those of us who spend any of our time raising money, asking for money, looking for funding, asking someone to give us something to do what we want to do, this is probably the most important question. Why is it important? So what? Who cares? Does it make sense? And how will it make sense for, for me and for you and for a broader audience or a broader um, constituency? So uh, I thank you, Hans, for that term. Um, that's the new thing I'm taking away. In terms of the challenge or the question ahead of us, what I love about meetings like this is that I get to listen and talk and connect. Um, and I think the challenge, Steve, honestly, and Fraunhofer too, 
is how do we turn all this talk into action? How do we translate all of this brain power into making a difference? And I think that when we connect that to what makes sense, um, we can start to move it forward, understanding mistakes will be made, things won't be perfect, it won't always work, but I think that that effort of demonstration is very difficult. It's a big challenge and it's up to us to take that on. Thank you. Thank you. The first thing that I'm taking home is really the insight that transformation is key uh, for resilience. And I think what Brian Walker presented this morning were some extremely helpful thoughts, uh, how important it is, and to think also in terms of what we can learn from ecological systems. And then also, uh, what Michel Bruno presented about the Christchurch. Christchurch is a wonderful example about transformation, that it's not just going back, uh, bouncing back. No, it's not bouncing back. It's really creating a, something new. And I think that's uh, what, what I've seen always. It's so important to have showcases to illustrate how this works, and I think th th those pieces will be very helpful for me uh, to, to move forward in the area of resilience. The challenge, it's even a little bit sad for me. I would call it this knowing doing gap, and it uh, reaches in this, into this political arena. There's a lot of uh, valuable information and knowledge around, and when it comes to implementation, it's this power play. This power play, and we always end up close to a solution that's close to zero. The only is very small move, and this is totally contradictory to the aspiration to be able to transform. So that's uh, one thing that, I, yeah, it makes me thinking a lot. Tobias, I'd like you to take the, um, as well, your, your new knowledge and, and big question from your perspective. So the, the new thing for me is a, is a positive thing because this is the first time I've been in such a meeting with so many disciplines that we actually uh, listen to each other and learn from each other much more than fighting about the, the wording. <laughs> so this is really good. Um, the challenging thing uh, I saw is uh, actually what you, sh what you uh, showed in your slide just now. Um, there seem to be so many definitions of resilience and so many metrics for resilience about uh, com complex, simple metrics uh, that though we are talking about the same thing, uh, even resilience itself is so complex that um, we maybe need a metric for all the definitions. <laughs> um, so that's one, one of the takeaways from an engineer point of view. If, um, uh, Michelle, you showed the, the bridges with the disposable elements, and uh, this is also a kind of transformation, but this is completely different from uh, community resilience and other political questions, because it's just a question of engineering. So I'm still struggling with bringing this all together, but I'm, I'm more hopeful than ever before. <laughs> Outstanding. Maybe I'll share my, my uh, final. I think one really new thing that came out of one of the panel's discussions yesterday, I think is really worth this community wrestling with, which is looking at getting to individual resilience and particularly this issue of the immune system as the ultimate sort of uh, uh, resilient uh, enterprise, really entity that's been evolved obviously in a very powerful way. But I think when we go to that, that level of the biomedical as well as individual, it makes it now very personal. Right? It's not us talking about it in this sort of abstract collective way, but if we're able to tie in a bit more insight about what makes individuals resilient, including some of the biomedical pieces of that, and then we can take those concepts and apply them to these much more complex systems or networks, I think it's eminently relatable. And uh, so, so more, I think, bridges need to be built in that realm, perhaps, uh, than we've been doing so far. We've, we've taken it primarily from the engineering or, you know, or the, uh, the ecological and so forth. That, that may be an area where there's, there's real possibility for, for growth. Uh, you know, in terms of a big challenge, I guess, I, um, you know, I, I see this from my world as how I've embraced 
uh, so much the resilience work as somebody who came out of primarily a national security, international security studies was my, my PhD realm. I think our biggest challenge is, in fact, replacing resilience as the overarching objective of government versus security as a overarching function. I had an opportunity to address my, my, my alma mater, the Coast Guard Academy and the Corps of Cadets, and I pointed out to them that the only mention of the word secure in the founding document for the U.S. government, the Constitution, is in the preamble. And it's to secure the blessings of liberty. To secure the blessings of liberty. So if security is an end unto itself, at the expense of the liberties that basically our founders put their lives at risk for, we've lost our way. And so making the re our resilience would be an overarching is the continuity of those liberties, the continuity of those values are what really we're trying to secure, which we can only do by greater degrees of resilience. But I think this plays very much into the power politics issue here. As long as you basically say the responsibility of our top leadership is to provide for security, we end up with a directive top-down, largely patriotical kind of set of, of, of drivers. And if we're not asking the question, what is it that we're trying to secure after all? Uh, then we really have kind of lost our way. And so the resilience, I think, opportunity is to potentially shift that paradigm, to essentially take on the politics of fear and anxiety, which are real. Uh, anxieties are real for lots of reasons because of the complex, interconnected world we're in and the inequities that are associated with that. But at the same time, the empowerment of the process of building resilience, as we sort of captured here, I think can be a great vaccination, going back to the immune system, to the body politic, to building of social capital, that these all are sort of key elements that in fact help, I think, uh, potentially um, um, uh, address this risk. But I think the race is on, and so that speaks to the urgency of this. While we can't just sort of add academics to our traditional pace, and as I kind of laid out a little bit yesterday of, well, we'll do basic science, and then we'll do, hand it off to the applied, and then we'll, on, and so forth here. We just don't have that 30, 40 year cycle because I think the biggest risk is in the political side uh, is the no, you should be afraid. You should disconnect. You should, this is happening in real time. These are the primary answers being provided to the population, not most of the answers that we've talked about here. And do you reach a tipping point, you know, going to this um, uh, one element of resilience, but a tipping point where civil society basically starts to no longer see the value. Of, of, in, of openness, of engagement. Um, that, that, I feel, is one of our big risks that we're seeing playing out in headlines in real time right now. So, urgent work. Uh, we're going to be spending some time amongst the, uh, the participants, you know, who have signed on as a part of the Global Resilience Network, really trying to figure out where we go from here, right? This, this has been a very rich, uh, and we really owe such a, a debt of, uh, uh, such a debt to all of you for helping to really add, you know, that fine cuisine to this, uh, to this very rich conversation. But the network was not set up just for the sharing of knowledge, right? Uh, again, not as a, a community interest. We have a lot of community interests. There's a lot of people sign MOUs. There's a lot here. It's really how we can deal with the converting that knowledge into true application. And the research community has a lot to contribute. But our track record, as we heard from a few of our practitioners, has not been great often in communicating to the people who make decisions about resources and policy and so forth, and or to the market. And so I think the element of this is, okay, how do we, one, make sure the knowledge we're sharing is actually good knowledge, you know, that we're all having the best sort of possible product here. But very importantly, how do we get it to the folks who really need to act on it to make that difference? And so that, that is what animated the establishment of the network. And it's one that is a clearly big challenge, as we've sort of laid out here, but one that I hope will provide increasing answers for. I know it will take a growing group, but we should, and I suspect, uh, you know, when we have our 10th annual summit, it'll probably have to be a bigger venue than the one we have here uh, because of the, the, the need of getting as many folks involved as we can and hopefully the validation of the, the life of the network of being here. But at the same time, we really have to make sure how we channel that in ways that you know, we'll get to uh, the desired outcomes. 
So I want to conclude, I guess, on, I think on behalf of all of us here, to be us to really thank, of course, Fraunhofer, EMI, for, for hosting, putting together such a spectacular event, and all your team here, and Daniel, and Sarah, and, You're welcome. and Benjamin, and so, you know, really just tremendous. Uh, thank you for uh, a very, very special event. You're very welcome. So uh, let, me, uh, let me end on a little optimistic note. We've, we've heard about uh, a lot of complex systems and how complex it is to bring uh, resilience into politics and so on. And um, when I explained at dinner yesterday to Paul, who's sitting over there, um, the complexity of the business model and the organization model of Fraunhofer, which is moderately successful and uh, very resilient, um, he suggested to me a, uh, a career in comedy. So uh, <laughs> it must be very complex and it's still thriving. Uh, so I'm, I'm very optimistic that uh, all the other complex systems we are thinking about will still be thriving even though we have a lot of risks on, on each side. So um, I would like to thank the audience very much um, for coming to this uh, conference and I would like to thank you. Um, and I guess, Daniel, you are making signs for me. Oh, okay. fabulous. All right. Good. Thanks. Here we are. I know he's running for the door, so hey, <laughs> please maybe open up and just maybe a bit of the air. Let me, the same questions I asked the group here, and you can either one, okay? Um, so for a comment here, what you have learned, and maybe a big question you think the group should ask. Let's, let's do maybe that for a little bit. Who wants to start that conversation? Ah, I intimidated the heck out of you. <laughs> Warren, I'm following you. You got to start. <laughs> I'm picking on Warren. Do we have a microphone? No, that's. Oh, okay. All right, all right. You get spared just in time. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, th I think it's it's been great to hear the interdisciplinary conversations going. I think um, something that is clear from the work that we do is I think that you have to have a top-down and a bottom-up approach. It's when you combine those two that you have success. And I think that's where the challenge lie is that we have a lot of um, activities and initiatives and research happening looking at how we can do to the community or for the community. What we need is I think also an um, a grassroots level or grassroots resilience movement where people like the climate change movement with the youth, where people actually stand up and demand action because that is, I mean, the political will is the difficult thing. And we, if you see the recent IPCC report, we know that we have run out of time to actually mitigate climate change. We now have to deal with increased temperatures and it's it's a it's a known fact we have to deal with it it's going to become worse we're entering the era of disasters so we have a very small window of opportunity to do really important work and it's combining the two approaches i think that's the really important thing thank you great i think again reinforcing the urgency of the effort here but really another very powerful message we've heard all the days of bottom up and engaging and, and mobilizing and being informed by uh, particular young people on that. Who, Warren, I, I'm still putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, uh, Steve, um, this morning, uh, I, I'd have to say, Brian, that I heard uh, an entirely uh, different take on resilience than one we normally hear at these conferences. And I appreciate that, and it's something that I can take away with me. As a matter of fact, you've sold another book because I'll go buy it now. Uh, it, <laughs> It, it really was intriguing in a different way to look at all of this. And so that's sort of the new thing that I'm going to take away and, and spend some time thinking about. But I'm not a scholar. I'm not an academic. Uh, I'm not one of those people. And what I do um, somewhat, sometimes successfully, is try to communicate some of the great work that's being done by people like you and, and those on the stage and people in the room with um, people like me uh, who are living out there in the real world and are, are, are trying to lead communities and are mayors and, 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 and folks like that. And I really fear that even the things that I've heard, I, so this is my, kind of my challenge, 
that the things that I've heard this week are often just not very translatable to the mayor who's sitting down there in the city and is dealing with the problems and, and his big problem today is potholes, uh, you know, or uh, somebody else out there. So uh, if there's a challenge for us, I think as we go forward, it's not just figuring out that complex diagrams or all of the things that I've seen, but it's how do we get somebody to understand this in a way that actually can be used? And, and I think we've got a lot of work to do in that area. Great. Thank you, Warren. Anybody else want to hear? Right here, over here. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I'm slightly overwhelmed with <laughs> all the, you know, uh, the thoughts and uh, the kind of things that have been discussed. Uh, I think I agree with others uh, when uh, I say that. Um, from Brian, what we heard this morning, resilience is not about bouncing back to original uh, situation, is something which is uh, really something. Uh, and also, I think yesterday, Michelle mentioned something about compassion, about uh, including joy and happiness as part of uh, the resilience uh, building process. And also uh, to see um, that uh, there are so many of us who are uh, doing research or working on similar uh, themes, similar activities, that's really something, so thank you. Uh, just one thought as a way forward, I think, uh, and I was having this conversation yesterday with some of the other colleagues here, was that probably it would be good to uh, have more conversations, thought leaders and practitioners from the global south, because there is so much to learn, so, so many, uh, you know, proof of concepts emerging from our part of the world, and uh, not just in terms of knowledge sharing, but also, uh, let's face it, it's a big you know, opportunity for everyone here in the room. So uh, that is something which I would like to suggest as a way forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. I think it's such an important issue in terms of, again, who we grow uh, toward, because it was clearly a bias, I think, in many of our presentations, not uh, about that, so, to some extent, bouncing back, but the conservative quality of, okay, we, we've inherited this legacy infrastructure, we've got to figure out how we work. So, and, and there's obviously a lot of the world that doesn't even have those things to, uh, to uh, uh, preserve. And there's a transform, the transformation, I think, is so key for that. Yeah, but did you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to respond. I think um, you made a very good point about the fact that much of our theory and that has been developed in the places where we all live and, and we're using that kind of so social system structure. There's so much to learn from the other parts of the world. That framework that we're developing, the Raptor, was funded, as I said, by the Global Environment Fund for the developing countries. So we've run trials with that in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, and in some uh, Pacific island. And we're learning an incredible amount about how different the, the societies work and what makes for resilient people. And um, those are not really incorporated yet. So I think resilience has a lot to learn by doing comparative studies of the developing in the developed world. And we shouldn't get hung up on just our high class, uh, very wealthy developed part of the world. So I, I thank you for making that point. Great, great. Yeah, I, I'm th thinking back to Garrett's presentation a little bit here about you know, that very well off uh, uh, part here may not be as resilient as, and we have the dynamism of it. it there's a lot we can learn from, uh, from the developing world who are dealing with adversity almost on a daily basis. So uh, that's key. Who else wanted to? Way in the yeah. back. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm sorry I have uh, like a catch a cold, so my voice is a little bit uh, weird though. Um, but um, I want to point out one of the um, good things that I learned these two days is how we compared actually resilience to immunity. Uh, since I need immunity as well, so I think it's a good thing to compare it to life, to living systems. And um, one of the second points, uh, I don't know if it can be a challenge for achieving resilience is we talk about data and we talk how we can use data to uh, like achieve resilience in systems. And what about um, when we are facing la lack of data or da data privacy? Is it going to be a challenge or is it going to be like uh, uh, something that can block uh, to achieve resilience? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Very, very good question. Uh, anybody else? Oh, yeah. 
I'm sorry to be chirping in all the time, but I just wanted to comment on this immune system thing. It is actually um, a model being used by a number of people working on this, Simon Levine from Princeton, for example. But what I like to, what I like about the way, if you do look at it, it's got an evolutionary history. So it has evolved to be successful over a very long period of time. And it has two components. It's got the white blood cells, who are kind of like general resilience. They mop up all kinds of things. And then it's got specified for antibodies. So the, what, what long-term evolutionists said, you can't do it all one way. And you need a more generic way of doing things. And you need a specified way. And it's too expensive to do it just all specified. And so when I, I was amazed when I learned all of that, because we've come up with general and specific resilience from working on case studies, but it coincides with this evolutionary outcome of the immune system. And uh, there's a lot in there if you follow it up in the literature. It's a very good point. Thank you. <laughs> John? Uh, the, the, one of the things that, I've, that, that, I've, that I'm taking away from uh, our time together, and it's related, uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly how it's related to the immune system uh, issues. So I'll just spit it out. Maybe somebody else can spot it. But that, that's our ability to visualize based on real-time data across this wide expanse of disciplinary areas that, have, that, that we have to integrate in some fashion to both understand, make sense of resilience, and then be able to act upon this sort of a holistic or systemic uh, sort of view. And I think in the human body, we have all these sensors going on, spotting what's going on, integrating it into some, some point of immediate action, uh, because it's all been trained in. Uh, and that's one of the problems that we face is the one that Daniel Kahneman has brought to the surface, which is 96% of the time we're running on autopilot uh, in our ability to change into a space where we, we can bring all of those pieces together, I think is a big challenge uh, for us. Uh, and if, I think if we can accomplish that, uh, we'd take a huge step forward, that process of sense-making by integrating a wide range of uh, real-time data. And the technology is starting to make that data available to us. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's a, a thought that I'm taking away. I mean, that, that, that's, that's fair for me as well in terms of that learning process. Again, another, I think, bridge that needs to be built a little bit deeper. And it is the arts community. You know, artists convey a lot of information, you know, in a very compact way that's very often motivational and, and, and informative. And the degree to which we have such complexity, right, I often beat up on my academic colleagues because sort of the more complex the model is, the giddier they get, right? <laughs> like, look, it's how nuanced and, right, and because you'll be the one paper that will be standing out in the crowd as founding it, but not very useful going to Warren's point here for somebody like a mayor, right? So we really, if we say communication is a key because basically inclusion is key to doing this here, we really got to tap the folks who actually know how to communicate in different ways. And it can be music, it can be art, but just visualization tools that are certainly becoming more powerful in lots of ways in our digital age. You know, there's probably a lot there that can be helpful. And uh, so again, another rationale to keep, uh, to keep this cross-disciplinary conversation going. Anybody else? Okay, well, with, with that, just, okay. I'll just comment on the, we'll data, yeah. on the data question in the back <coughs> about privacy and where where this notion of resilience has been connecting across so many different disciplines and sectors, and this notion of, of privacy, and the, the, the other allegory of that is sensitivity. So a single map layer of you know, stormwater is not sensitive. You start layering that with power and telecom and you know, evacuation routes, and now, now suddenly someone says, that information in the system's thinking is too sensitive. Because now you're giving information and presenting it in ways that might get to your security question, right? right? And so I think that this question of data versus information is, is another challenge, another opportunity here for the people here to really sort through and interpret <coughs> what are we trying to convey and why and to whom. And then maybe the, the raw data piece whether it's private or secure or sensitive or available or wrong, you know, can then be better um, applied in a, in a way that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think there's, 
this is a, so a long-standing right debate, particularly in the security side. What I, this, the circle that I can't square often with the, ooh, we're reaching a point where there's too much potential bad guys might have roadmaps kind of argument here is, you know, the, the ultimate role of politics is making choices, you know, about where we're going to invest our resources and values. And the polity is not going to make choices about doing something about a problem it doesn't know exists. And so you end up with this dilemma of you basically have put under, you know, the, the, uh, the cone of silence, the problem, but then nobody's animated to address the problem, especially if it's outside the control of the national security community or the federal government or the law enforcement community to do it. And so, so the key here is an academic challenge. And I think network science gives us a lot of tools on this as well, is to anonymize some of the data, right? I mean, we, we don't need to have the blueprint of where these things are. If there's a way that we can convey the need and fit information, right, but in a way that, that addresses this, but this is key. And I would, I would say one, one just very practical issue on resilience being applied to terrorism, for instance, if we in fact talk about at least some element of getting back to normal, you know, from these events, not overreacting from the events and so forth, one key is the speed at which you do forensics after some attack is very important to reducing the panic factor. And so you could actually, one challenge can be, we can use new tools instead of the sorry, we're going to shut everything down because the next three weeks we've got to collect evidence <laughs> to basically, no, the imperative, you've got to do that much quicker because the restoration and getting the community or getting the system back up online is actually a higher order goal, right? And so again, lots of wavy opportunities where, where we can help the security folks actually do what they should be doing better uh, while at the same time not having that Trump uh, in, in, in I guess as a term, uh, <laughs> not overcome uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the efforts that we're trying to build for a much more engaged, open, and inclusive process. Right. So to be over to you here for maybe the final closing. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Again. Oh. <laughs> oh, there was one more. All right, we'll give one it. One more. Please, one more, because I think we have the, the minutes, so we're going to take it. <laughs> we have five more minutes. Okay. One more question, Daniel? Okay. Yeah, I also really enjoyed the um, last couple of days, a lot of uh, very interesting insights. Uh, one thing in particular that was striking was this divide between what um, the side of the academic community who works on these abstract models do with what people who are more like practitioners do. And there is, so as an, we already know that uh, the abstract um, so we need some abstract models because we need to generalize them to different contexts. So some suspicion about some of those work is natural, but what I noticed was uh, some of the conversations I had, the whole idea of doing modeling was like being um, questioned. And I, that was eye-opening to me. And I hope like in the future events we have some more time, some in the form of breakout sessions or things of that sort, to sit down with those people and come to kind of like a mutual understanding of how to translate some of their, need, their needs to some kind of abstract models. Because I think domain agnostic models are still needed, but we need to tune the assumptions and the parameters of those models according to what's needed in the practices. The, and another idea is, um, some of the papers in the management science community, they, some, in some of the journals, they ask people, they ask their researchers to identify two or three different takeaways for the managers. Even though the body of the paper is very abstract, could be very mathematical, not necessarily something that a typical manager could connect to, but those three or four takeaways are always there and the journal editors actually want them to be there. So that's something that we could, as a community, also start thinking about. Okay. Thank you, Balak. So now, yeah. let's uh, thank the panel again for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs>